Good morning, everyone. Sabah al-khair. Good to have you all with us this morning. If y'all can stand up with me and just greet God with a word of prayer, prayer. Lord, we welcome you this place. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here. And uh, we thank you for allowing us to come and worship you collectively, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We come, Lord, to declare that this morning. May our hearts and voices pour out with praise to you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Good to see you. Let's worship the Lord.
God is good. Amen. Amen. He's faithful. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. What a blessing. It seems like I haven't been here in a while. Well, it's great to be back home. Thank you, Jesus. Our God is a good God. His love never fails. And I'm, I'm not going to preach on this, but I thought of this this morning. Can somebody tell me? What is that? What is that? What's it remind you of? What does what does James say about our life? It's that quick. It's pretty amazing. We get so focused on the cares of this life, and it's gone like that. And we may come back to that. I just thought thought of that this morning, so <laughs> I was going to preach on it, but I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to read uh, from two small passages from the book of Matthew. One's in the first chapter, and one is in the last chapter. And since we're coming upon Christmas, we are in the, it's the first second week of December already, right? Praise God. I'm going to jump all the way down to verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and, willing to put her, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, anybody ever have an angel appear to you and speak to you? You know, you know this comes back, you know, because it's something here, what it says before that, that Joseph was a just man. I was reading another translation before him. Being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. So, so watch. Being just, he, uh, and so it takes me back to where is our heart with people? Where is our heart with the Lord? Remember what happens when you walk with integrity of heart? You know, remember uh, King Abimelech took Sarah and God says, you're a dead man. She's married. And he said, Lord, would you kill, would you kill an innocent man? I took her out of the integrity of my heart. So watch what happens when you walk in integrity of heart because he's a just man, his heart is right, and he finds Mary with child and he hadn't been with her and they're engaged really that betrothal period is just almost the same as marriage except the relationship. So he being of integrity heart said, you know what, I'm just going to break this off quietly. But because his heart was right, now what happens? It opens the door for God to speak truth into your life. And then you have an opportunity to, to change. But we can, we can live like that in life. Yeah. You're making a decision for career, for calling, for someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Or, or even simple decisions every day. Maybe even driving. God says, no, God. listen, just say, Lord, I believe this is the way you want me to go. But here's my heart. If this is not you, Lord, my heart is open for you to come in and to direct my life. So what happens, the, the Lord comes to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord God, the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is, this is a, just a side trivial. When I get in the car with my kids, uh, especially my 10-year-old, Daddy, ask us Bible questions. Daddy, ask us Bible questions. And I love it, ask us Bible so sometimes I'll ask them easy ones. Sometimes I'll ask them really hard ones that they think they're too smart. But so, <laughs> but uh, I, I asked this one the other day. In the scriptures, there are four people that their names were foretold by God or an angel beforehand, before they were born. Do you know who they were? Say it again. That's right. John the Baptist, talking to Elizabeth. Okay, and Zach Zach Zacharias. So John the Baptist, and who's the second? Who's the another one? Jesus. Jesus. We just saw that. You shall call his name Jesus. Amen. Now there were two more. That's right, Isaac. God told Abraham. Remember, she laughed. She said, "And you shall name him Isaac." Laughter. There's one more. No. Nope. You wouldn't think this one was given a name beforehand. It was Ishmael when God spoke to Hagar as she was crying out to him. Her, her voice was heard, and you should, being, being that God hears, and you shall call him Ishmael. Isn't that interesting? There's four names given prior to their birth by the Lord himself. With it. That's a little trivial question. Anyway, so that's the kind of questions I ask my kids. They, 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 they got three out of the four also, but they didn't get Ishmael. So anyway, so, but I want us to watch this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will what? He will save his people from their. He will save his people from their. Okay, so watch. They're sending Jesus. He's sending Jesus. Jesus, God in the flesh, is going to be born to save his people from their sins. So I want you to see that. And then in the very last chapter of Matthew, we know it as the Great Commission, verse sixteen. This is after Jesus' resurrection, and he's been with them a while now. Now he's about to head up to his father in heaven, the ascension. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So let's think about this a moment. Jesus is going to come to save his people from their sins. And before he leaves, he tells his disciples, now go, go first, all authority has been given unto me. Go therefore. So now he's, he's imparting us with that authority to go in his name, to make disciples of all nations. Mark says to go and preach the gospel to every creature. So I want us to see this. Jesus came to save us from our sins. And the last thing he tells his disciples, now go. Go make disciples, go and preach the gospel. So it's no different for us. Jesus came to save us from our sins, amen? And we're still on the earth. Why? Because he wants us to touch other people's lives for eternity in the kingdom of God. So what's going on in the middle here? Well, watch this. If we need to focus on... No matter what's going on, he wants us to make disciples and preach the gospel. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes injustice is done to us. Sometimes we're, we're overtaken with God's goodness and abundance and blessings. And sometimes we really struggle, maybe health-wise, financially, relationship. Has anybody been there? But listen, if we still have breath, God expects us to declare who he is to this world. God, God wants us to allow people to know. I mean, the only thing we're taking to heaven is people. But in that process of telling, uh, so I, I guess First Thessalonians 4, what, what is the will of God? Watch this. The will of God is our, does anybody know the word? 
First Thessalonians 4, verse 1. The will of God for us is what? Our sanctification. Did you catch that? So we're born. We're born again when we say yes to Jesus. He has a call and a mission for all of our lives. To the, now, and we all do that in different ways, amen? Some may pray, some may give, some may declare or preach. But everywhere we go, people should really see our good works that our Father in heaven may be glorified. Our good works may be blessing people. It may be walking in kindness, generosity. You know, it's interesting if we go back in Matthew. So what are, what are we doing in that process? If just in Matthew, oh, he says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. He says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. When, so he, he's letting us know things we need to be doing that people can see who he is. Amen. He wants because he wants to establish his kingdom on the earth, even through us. Where when we enter into a place where we go, people should start, st start to sense the presence of God and even see the kingdom of God in action. How can they be so forgiving? How come they're so kind? How come they're blessing me? How come they're giving to me? Even in the midst of struggle in our own lives, yes. we're still here. So I, I, I want us to see a couple of things. And uh, you know me, I haven't done this in a while here. So come on, brother, let's get this big picture here. When he's here, I already know what I'm supposed to say. You can stand right here. Because the first part, Jesus came to save us from our sin. So we remember, y'all Y'all should be able to preach these. So, But in the beginning is God and holy and clothed in glory. Amen. And, and he sends forth, before even he sends his son, his Jesus, even in the old covenant, he formed and fashioned man in his own image. And why did God make us? He made us for what? For relationship, for fellowship. This was the initial covenant God established with Adam. You understand what I'm saying? So he established a relationship with man, not just this intimate love relationship, but he gave him dominion, really, to subdue the earth, to, to, to replenish, multiply. So there's a calling on, on, on Adam's life, and in that taking care of the garden, he could eat from any and every tree except from how many? One. Don't eat from that one tree. The day you do, shall, you shall surely die. And they did not die. Adam and Eve did not die that day physically. It may have started, but that day they died. Watch this. They died spiritually. They died in their relationship with God because that disobedience now became sin in the life of man who could no longer have a relationship with this holy daddy God that still loves man and God still wants to establish his covenant. And, and it's interesting how he allows man at this point to offer sacrifice unto God without the shedding of blood. There's no remission of sin. So, so as man... Man sinned, God allowed man to offer sacrifice, particularly on the Day of Atonement, the high priest in the Holy of Holies. You know the story, right? Well, and just so I can remind us, it's interesting, God would judge the sacrifice. Did you know that? That's good news for us, amen? And if God accepted or, you know, and saw that the sacrifice was good, he would allow, he would allow that blood for a season to cover our sin. Why? Because he wanted to keep this covenant, this love relationship with man. But man continued to sin, so man continued to sacrifice. And then God, in his wisdom, as we just read, as he spoke to Joseph, you shall bear a child, and this born by the Holy Spirit, and you shall call his name who? Jesus, right? What's his name again? Jesus. And he shall save his people from their and that's what happened. Jesus became the Lamb of God and was sacrificed for our sin, his perfect spotless life, dead and raised from the dead. And God takes the blood of his son Jesus. Does he cover our sin? No, because Jesus, the Lamb of God, what does he do? He, he takes away the sin of the world. Now he wants to cover us with his blood. And you should probably know the scripture by now. 2 Corinthians 5, the very last verse, 21. You talk about Jesus who knew no sin. It says he actually what? Became sin. So that we might become who? And man, I'm so glad you know that. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And just to encourage us before I go on from here. Uh, well, 
Jesus became sin, but no sin in him. What's interesting, watch this. The wages of sin is death. That's why Christ died. He took our sin. He took the sin of the world. Our sins have already been paid for. Amen? We're going to have to understand this picture to really go on with Christ. Our sins have been paid for. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but our sins have been paid for. Amen? So, so we, I want us to see that Jesus who knew that sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. But though Jesus became sin, there was no sin in him. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he overcame hell, sin, death, and the grave. Amen? And he's the Lord of God. And I love this. And he, he sealed eternal life. Amen? Ephesians says we're sealed unto the day of redemption. Jesus says nobody can take you from my hand. Nobody can take you from my Father. So I want you to see this picture. When you receive this gift of salvation, Jesus doesn't for, uh, force it on anyone. It's a gift. Though he's taken and paid for our sin, now he, the wages of sin is death, but the gift, free gift. Say free gift. Some of you, it's, 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 it's free for those who receive it, but how many of you know it's not free to pay for it? Somebody has to pay the cost. Anybody here do any Christmas shopping? Yeah? You're a wise man. He doesn't. So, but, anyway. but when you purchase a gift, you're paying for it, right? Now the one you're giving it to, they receive it. Or, or they take it back. Or, I mean, no. So, but, but listen, this, Jesus paid the price for our salvation, but it's a gift. And each one of us must receive this gift. Every person. Now, God doesn't force it on anyone. And nobody can receive it for you. Your mom, dad, pastor, preacher, church, teacher cannot receive this for me nor for you. I must choose and you must choose. So when you choose, when you, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you would be saved. What do you mean saved? It means you receive the gift of salvation. So when you truly believe and confess, you believe and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is how you receive this gift. So not only has Jesus saved you from your sin, now you receive the gift of salvation, righteousness, that you are delivered from your sin. Amen? It's a choice that you make. Now, uh, before I go on, I want us to see this picture because I, I, I'm in enough places where I don't think we understand this. If you read in Hebrews 5, watch this. He says, starting at verse 11, the, the writer says, I want to tell you more, but I can't. By now you should be teachers, but you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word. He says, you're infants, you're babies, and you still need milk. And then he says, why? He says, because. So why are these Christians that uh, over a couple decades have been walking and they haven't grown or they've fallen and haven't gotten back up? He says, because, watch this. He says, because you are not acquainted with the teaching of righteousness. See, listen, until we understand who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, that he has actually taken our sin and has now offered us a gift of righteousness, until we see this, you will not grow. Because what happens when you blow it and you sin, all of a sudden, condemnation, guilt, and shame keeps you from rising back up. Has anybody ever been there? We beat. Our, I mean, I used to beat myself up because I see myself as this, when I blow it, I still I see myself as a sinner. I'm unworthy. And and, and, and and here's a big thing. I was speaking in church. I said, so many of us think that our sin is more powerful than the blood of Jesus. Are you kidding me? Are we serious? You think you're so much more powerful? Your sin is so much more powerful? Than the blood of the Son of God? I can imagine the Father in heaven, Jesus going, Are they, uh, what's wrong with them? We, I gave my life. He took our sin. Even when I blow it, I'm still God's child, God's son. And until we understand this, we don't grow. Until we truly understand it, it's, it's hard to repent and get back up. You know, I, I remember I was preaching uh, preach at this church way on the past the north side of Houston, and I'd been there several times, and I'll never forget. Um, I, they called me again, and I, maybe I preached 10 times there. And, and the associate pastor calls me, and he says, Salim, 
uh, I, I just want you to know, we'd like you to come such and such date again. Yeah, okay. He says, and then he says something. He says, I want you to know that you and Pastor so-and-so are not on the same page. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you, when every time you do your, your scarf illustration, you're, you, you, you're, you're really saying to us there's the, there's the security of the believer and there's assurance of salvation. I said, well, yeah. And then he says, well, they don't believe that here. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, they believe yourself, you can lose your salvation, that it can be stolen. And I said, well, why are you telling me this now? I mean, you guys keep having me come preach. He said, well, we really like you and everybody always gets saved. I said, I guess so. They're getting saved again and again. I don't know. <laughs> so so, I, so I, I was kind of disturbed. Well, why did you tell me this? And, and, and you know, I, 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 and I've shared this before, and I said, Lord, help me. I, when I go, I still want to share, but I, I want to deal with this in a way that maybe they can understand. So they believe that you can lose your salvation. And scripturally speaking, and I know there's big debates on this, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but it's very clear you, that you actually can lose something because in Revelation 3, remember, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold on to what you have tightly. See to it that no one steals your crown. So your crown can be stolen. I don't know if I have a crown with me or not today. I, I've had to undo this. I wasn't planning on this. I don't see it. But anyway, if I had a hat, I, I'd put them on here. But it's not in this. Oh, that's eternity there. So, okay. So, 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 so watch this. So you can actually receive a crown. And we've talked about the five crowns. The crown of life. The crown of glory. glory the crown of righteousness. The crown of rejoicing. And... There's another crown that doesn't slip my mind a second, but, but watch this. It's possible to lose that crown because in Revelation 4, the elders that have crowns of gold, they, 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 they lay them at the throne of God, at the feet of Jesus. So, but watch, they're all dressed in white. So once you say yes to Christ, you really believe that Jesus paid for your sins and you're willing to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you receive this gift. You're a child of God. Now God has a mission and a calling for our life. And it's this fast. But while we're here, our lives are to make a difference in other people's lives for the kingdom of God. Because ultimately, even as you said, we're to go and make disciples. We are to preach the gospel. Amen? So during this process of, of sanctification, watch this. God, what's he doing? We've got to see what he's doing. We still have to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help me here. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we have to declare who Jesus is to this world. Understand what I'm saying? So during this process of sanctification, as we're walking through this life, God is what? He's conforming us into the image of Christ. That's what he wants to do while we're here in our own lives. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So here's the whole sanctification process right here in our minds. We have to catch this. God wants to transform us by the renewing of our mind. Okay, no longer am I going to respond and react in anger. Now I need to respond by the Spirit of God. No longer can I be unkind. I must be kind. No longer can I be selfish. I must be generous. No longer shall I look at them as terrorists. God sees them as the harvest, and I need to love them and pray for them. You understand what I'm saying? Because this is, this is the kingdom of God on the earth. When I go into a place, when we go into a place, they need to sense the presence of God. Even when I walk by people, and, and sometimes they, if I walk by somebody in a wheelchair, and I, don't, I, I, just, even, I just touch them, because I don't know. P Peter's shadow healed people. Paul's claws healed people. And I don't know, but at least I'm going to do my part to do what I know to do. So even in that mist, you know, I, I think in that, in that same chapter in, in, in Acts chapter 4, I, G, James says something along the lines, if you, if you don't do what you know to do, it's sin. Wow. I venture to say that there are some things we don't do that we should do. And sometimes I don't have enough courage to say, oh, may I pray for you? And sometimes I do. And someone says, well, what if they don't get healed? And I said, well, what if they do? I just want to obey God. He says, lay hands on the sick. He says, anoint with oil. He says to pray. So I'm just, so I'm going to roll away the stone. Amen. The tomb of Lazarus, roll away the stone. You do the natural. 
God does the supernatural. He raises the dead. So if he says to pray, anoint with oil, I'm going to do it. Understand? So, so if we, if we, as we read the Word of God and we see, during this process of sanctification, our focus isn't, oh God, I need to change this. And, and, and that, Listen, Jesus said, the Lord says, Paul says, it, if, I, if I, watch this, if I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I, I used to I used to fight on keeping my fighting my flesh. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't lust. I can't. And the more I focus on it, the the more I became enslaved to it. But when I saw, hey, I'm God's child, and you know what? I'm going to just keep getting back up, and I'm going to repent and get it back up every time I blow it, because I figure, you know, because I, I I was there's a young man I met I met 25 years ago. He was a student at HBU, and he was determined, he had already determined that he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So all his life he ran around, I mean, I mean, the whole time he was there, and I tried to go, no, you're talking. I saw him five years ago, so it's 20 years later. I was with my bride, at dirt, it was New Year's Eve thing, the, the New Year's Day. I met some people for breakfast up in, in the woodlands, and I saw him. And when I saw him, he, he, uh, he saw me and he kind of walked away. I said, no way. And a week later, he called me. I hadn't heard from him in 20 years. And he still felt like he was the same person. He says, no, I'm disqualified. I can never serve God. And he used that scripture in 1 Corinthians 9 where, where, where Paul says that, that some, when, the, when a racer runs, when an athlete competes, he competes for a crown. And Oh, that's the other crown, the incorruptible crown. Okay. Uh, for for they, they compete for a crown that will actually perish, that, will, that is corrupt. But we for an incorruptible crown, that one that will not perish. Therefore, therefore I buffet, no, not buffet, I buffet my body. He keeps my, he says, I keep my body under, watch this, so that I will not be really disqualified. So he felt like he was disqualified and he was no longer able to serve or follow God. And I really struggled with this. I thought, well, I see that in the scripture. But we don't determine if we're disqualified or not. It's God who does. If there's something in our life that... So, so here's what happens. Watch how the enemy's working on several Christians' life. We think we've messed up so bad, so long, that I, I can't go on with God. I'm, I'm not going to finish my race. But, but watch this. If God wants to take you out, he has no problem removing you. Isn't that correct? Paul reigned, or King Saul reigned 40 years and God removed him. S Sodom and Gomorrah, God had no problem removing them. Amen? Yeah. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. And, and what happened? Boom. God King Agrippa received glory and worm broke struggle. God has no problem removing anyone, does he? So listen, I don't need to remove myself. Uh, let me be real here. I remember when lust was a claw in my brain and anger gripped my heart and I blew it, blew it, blew it. And I thought, you know, I can't even go. I, and then God started, I, I just started to see, you know what? Every time I fall, I'm just going to get back up anyway. God, I repent. I don't want to do this. I can't do it on my own. I need your help. But so I'm going to keep going. And thank God I didn't take myself out because not only delivered, not only delivered me, but now God has touched thousands of lives. Why? Because he still wants to reach people. He still wants disciples. He still wants his gospel out. So I've learned something about since God scheduled our days before we began to ever begin to breathe. There's nothing about our life that surprises God. He knows our bondages, our iniquities, our struggles, our issues, our lust, our anger, our, our fornication, our deception, our lying, our cheating. God knows all about us and he still called and chose us. For such a time as this, what an amazing God. So if we'll receive this gift, knowing that Christ has paid for our sin, watch this. Now I have a mission to proclaim this good news to the world. And during that process, as God sanctified me, if I fall and get and mess up, I'm quick to repent and get back up. And if I, I've learned something pretty much every morning when I wake up, I go. And, and I'm breathing. I thought, oh, I guess God's not done with me. 
And we need, and listen, we need to live like that. If we still have breath, and, and just by the Holy Spirit before we pray, often in this life, injustice is done to us. But our focus still has to be Jesus and the kingdom. Look at Joseph, abused, rejected, abandoned, lied about. And when he had an opportunity to sin, he said, watch his focus. He said, how can I sin against my God? His focus was still the kingdom of God. Opportunity to compromise, whether it's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Uh, they didn't. They would not deny their God. And it got them in the worst trouble. A fiery furnace, a lion's den. But what did God do? God turned that around, didn't he? Not only spared their lives, but all of a sudden the kings go, oh, their God must be the real God. So how will we respond in this life as we, listen, you already know you're God's child. You know you're going to heaven. God wants to use you to touch other people's lives. And during this life, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust for other things, the, the sin, the iniquity, the bond, the fight of the flesh, that none of that surprises God. Let's just keep on going, keep repenting, keep getting back up and thinking, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say this and I really will pray. I remember I was at a 20 year class reunion at my high school in Florida, Deerfield Beach High School. And there were these football players there at my table. I, I played several sports, I played football with these guys. And they were all serving the Lord, this, the four guys in particular. And I was so excited. I said, oh, God, you guys are. Because I, no, no one shared Christ with me in high school. So, and I was so excited that these four guys at my table. We're, I mean, we're seriously serving God. And I got so excited. And, and then I said, when did, when did y'all get saved? When did y'all become Christians? When did you receive this gift? Of when did you make Jesus your Lord? I was so fired up. And their heads just kind of went down. I said, like, what is going on here? And one of the guys, Lou goes, um, well, Selim, we, we, we were saved in high school. I said, no, you weren't. I mean, no one ever shared. And, uh, and they, they, no one ever shared Christ with me. And, and they go, no, we, we were saved. And I go, what are you talking? No way. And my, I thought, well, how come no one ever said anything to me? I was kind of shocked. And I'll never forget, Jeff Wheeling, number 51. I remember his number. He said, this is what he said. He said, well, Salim, your, your life was holier than ours. You know, I was most, I was praying, fasting, loving, honoring, obeying my parents, no alcohol, no cursing, no drugs. I mean, and they were partying. But because of their lifestyle compared to my lifestyle, they never shared Christ with me. And I get it. But even when you mess up, let God's good news still be sown. You hear what I'm saying? Because that, that, that message, it, it's, it's interesting. The seed, God's word is truth. Maybe this farmer doesn't believe in it. Maybe that farmer does. But that seed determined on what kind of soil or heart determines the harvest of that. So even if you aren't serving the Lord fully at this point in your life, don't be afraid to sow that seed. Because uh, uh, I'll say I'll say it like this, you know, I wouldn't plan this. But remember, they said to Paul, "Well, so, some people are are Paul's in prison. They said some people are are preaching this out of selfish ambition, envy, jealousy. They were preaching God's word, and they weren't genuine in their faith. And Paul says, "I'm just glad the gospel is being preached." Isn't that interesting? Because I always thought. How can those people that stand before God and he says, depart from me, and he puts them on the left hand side, and, and, and how can they say, well, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. We've done these miracles. They've done these, we've raised the dead. How can they do those things but never really know him? Does that make sense to you? Because it's not them. Because what? Maybe I don't believe in this gospel. But if I tell you God loves you and Christ died for you and rose from the dead 
and you believe it, even if I don't, you can receive that seed and get a harvest in your own life. Amen. So, so think about it. So whether it's out of selfish ambition, envy, and that's, that's, that'll be judged between the Lord and that person during that process. But that doesn't change the power of the seed. Because how can he say, how can I do miracles? How can I prophesy and do it in his name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Well, because maybe I didn't. But that seed still had life. God bless you. So I, and I'm, I'm, I wasn't planning on going this, but I just want you to think, sometimes we think, well, I'm unworthy and I'm not worthy enough. And granted, our focus needs to allow God to do what he wants to do in our life in conformance to the image of his son. But don't rob this high school football player even an opportunity to hear the gospel, the good news of Christ, because you're not worthy enough to sow the seed. If not, then just drop a track. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Leave something with me that God can start working in my life. Amen? Father, thank you for your amazing grace and love. Lord, I thank you, we thank you that you sent Jesus to save us from our sins. And Lord, your blood has and is much more powerful than our sins, so much that you've taken our sin and you've offered us this gift of righteousness, this gift of salvation, this gift of eternal life. And Lord, we said, and maybe you're listening now, maybe you know you need to receive this gift of salvation. Just say, God, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I do believe he paid for my sin. And Lord, I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I ask you now, make me the Lord. I ask you to come in and be the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Now, Jesus, I know you got a plan for my life. And I know you want me to make disciples. I know you want me to preach the gospel. So, Lord, help me to keep my eyes on you. Help me to focus on the kingdom of God, on eternity. And, Lord, as I go, may I, I allow you to sanctify me more into the image of your son. But Lord, even when I blow it, I know that you love me and I'm still yours. You said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. And you're with me to the end of the age. So Lord, I repent and I'll get back up every time and let this, this world know that Jesus is Lord. Lord, seal this in our hearts by the grace of God in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. Hey, give my bro a hand. I thought he did awesome. Thank you.
that saved the world for its sins, that reconciled man with you, Jesus. As we carry out through this Christmas season, Lord, let us always remember the first gift before we open any presents, Lord, is you. Remind us, Jesus, how amazing you are. We love you, Lord. We praise you, this whole church. Let us go on so people see that gift in us, Jesus, not just this season, but always. In our Heavenly Father, in the sweetest name we pray, Jesus' name. Good morning, everybody. As we uh, offer the Lord our tithes and offerings, uh, we've got a few announcements to make. So, talking about the upcoming events. All right, so we've got a Christmas celebration by Agape Worship Team. Thank you, Lord, for all of you for a wonderful worship today, and we look forward for you going all out for that worship team. So that's Sunday, December 23rd, 2018, 10.30 a.m. So, special service. Thank you, Lord. Um, this was great. Look forward to see what's even better than one. So, Lord bless you all. All right, we've got the Church Christmas Bake Sale. Lots of things happening on December the 23rd. So, this is before and after the Christmas services. So, again, donations, variety of bake cooked. Oh, that's even better. So, the bakes are going to be done by you. <laughs> so, we we'll look forward to seeing that, and that'll be an extra incentive for us to donate and participate. So, Thank you, everybody, who is going to be baking. Thank you in advance. Lord bless your work. Okay? Uh, home groups. Uh, we've got the men's and the women's home groups that are um, 7.30 p.m. respectively. Um, I know our co-ed group is um, in Christmas break, but this coming Sunday um, we're having a little get-together. You don't have to have come. We'd love to have you come over and join with us. So, Lord bless you all. Participate in the home groups. Okay? Power of God's Names by Tony Evans is still going in. This is Churchwide Ladies Bible Study. When I say churchwide, that means Agape and ACH. So we encourage ladies to go and enjoy and learn more about the power of God's multiple name. Next one, please. All right. Church Online. The church is available on each and every electronic means. So for those of us who would like to see it again or tell friends to come and see it we're available on facebook live uh, Inst uh is it instagram yes youtube so look for it we're on all of them so god bless you there anything else and if you are new we would love to meet with you at the front in the foyer and then later on we'll have a special gathering together in the um, fellowship room while the arabic church starts so we'd love to meet you get to know you better and get to contact you Okay.